Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. We're really pleased this morning to uh, have our uh, uh, a candidate for rheumatology. So, um, uh, Dr. Hussam Sarakbi is uh, currently a professor at uh, Wayne State University. Uh, he trained uh, at uh, a variety of places. Before he was at Wayne State in rheumatology, he was actually um, uh, a full professor there, associate professor at uh, at the same place. But before that, he was an assistant professor at uh, Cornell in uh, Qatar. And uh, he's got a, a, an interesting, sort of curious route of uh, uh, board certification and um, a variety of interests before settling in rheumatology. And maybe you know you could tell us how how all, that all happened. Um, but you don't find too many people who are uh, boarded in uh, who residencies and ENT anesthesia uh, before coming to Chicago in uh, internal medicine um, and doing his fellowship. That uh, he was a Wisconsin Badger for a bit doing a rheumatology fellowship uh, before going into uh, academia. And he's going to share with us this morning uh, the uh, a lot of fascinating information on biologics and, and medications in rheumatology. Welcome. <laughs> good, to, you. good to see you. Thank you. So today I decided to talk about biologics and rheumatology. Why I decided to do that, uh, actually this um, uh, presentation is intended for non-rheumatologists. So I'm doing that rheumatology people, fellows, for example, or faculty to be like a much higher detail. So, I, so I, I just like my, my goal of, of this is to uh, one minute. That's on the next slide. So my, my goal of this is for a non rheumatologist to be familiar with all those new medications that we we have in the body. I know it gets overwhelming. Like for example, if I talk about oncology, I'm not an oncologist, and they have all those medications and have no idea what they are doing. You know, become tough. So I've done this actually at Wayne State, and they liked it. And I said, well. Let me do it here. So uh, people who are not rheumatologists, they are familiar at least with, with different classes that we use in rheumatology, what side effects to watch for. You as non rheumatologist maybe in trainers have seen somebody on one of these drugs and he or she is having one of those side effects and you're wondering if uh, that's something, you know, it's from the drug or not. So, um, uh, so I'll go on different classes, uh, different location under each class, um, not in too much details, but I mean, just the number of drugs by itself is overwhelming. So bear with me. Um, so why they call it biologics? Because they are actually like, you know, when they do those drugs, they are like, you know, produced within the living cell. And biologists are, are, are not only in rheumatology. So many of you are from other specialties and you do use biologists in your uh, areas, um, oncology, infectious disease, et cetera, nephrology. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a biotechnology uh, methods that make those drugs you know, called biologics. And it's good actually to understand some of those terminology. Uh, so no culture for uh, biologics, when you hear the word set, for example, it is one example, it's like the for the diffusion of receptor to, to the uh, FC part of the human immunoglobulins. Some of them are immunoglobulins, but you know, like you know, the, the wording, uh, it may mean something. So when you say MAB, uh, that's the monoclonal antibody. When you say uh, the, the word, when you see the, the letter X, so Z MAB, that's chimeric. Chimeric means like the part of that's coming from uh, like an animal, for example, a mouse. So that has some implications. For example, if you're getting a drug that has animal part in it, so there's more autoimmunity against the drug. So this drug might lose efficacy sooner than another drug, which is like more human. So Zumab, it's more humanized. When they say UMAB, that's for the human. So more tolerance, more survival for, for that drug. So good to know those like, you know, um, uh, wording. And that's just an example. Um, if it's like fully mouse, it wasn't on the previous slide, that's MUMAB. If it's chimera, so chimeric is like this yellow part is from mouse. So that's uh, 75 from human, 25 from like mouse marine. So that's chim chimeric drug. And humanized, even less part coming from a mouse, 5%, uh, human is fully human. And keep moving. 
Um, and those are the main classes that we use in rheumatology. So uh, there's other classes that use non-rheumatology ward, but in rheumatology, those are the main ones. So we use the antigen alpha, those are actually the first one came to market, and then the other inhibitions. We use the I6 inhibitions, which also used in other uh, um, non-rheumatology wards as well. Uh, an example would be tocilizumab, which is used uh, for COVID, very famous. I-17 inhibition, um, and then we have the I-12, slash 23 uh, blockade, post blockade, and B, depletion and inhibition. So those are the major ones. And now we're going to go like each class and you know, see some of those medications so we are more familiar. So if we talk about TF-alpha uh, blockade or inhibition, I should look what the first one came to market. So Apixumab came exactly in 1997. Um, and then a year after that came the counter set. And the Lumumab was in 2000. And then more drugs were coming. So that's how it became like overwhelming. I, should, I, I, said, I think I was lucky because when I first saw my fellowship, there was only one biology there. And then the second one, I didn't do my, my fellowship. Before I did my fellowship, the third one was, was there. So it was easier for someone like me to like, you know, learn about them. But somebody who was in rheumatology and see all those drugs and you know, like every year there's one or two coming. <laughs> I, I know that's very overwhelming. So the so map came later on, a blue map came after. I'm just using the generic name. I'm not using any brand name. So, um, and this is like uh, some of those uh, things, alpha and how they work. So, um, uh, so we talk about the, you know, the chimeric part. Let me see if I can use this here. So this is the chimeric part uh, for Suximab. Uh, so it does have that marine thing. And the remember map on the other, so it's exactly not the same, but it's like more like a human. Uh, so this is like came later on. It intercept has different way of work. It's, so, so it's a receptor antagonist. Uh, so it works differently. And that may actually has also some implication when Let's say I have a patient who is uh, responding to one of these two, and now he's not responding. If I change like how the like uh, the drug looks like, that may still like work for that you know patient. So like in rheumatology, for example, we have a guidelines like what to do if I fail like the first drug or the second drug. Should I go like from the same group or different group? Uh, uh, so one of the like implications is that how that look like because it does tell us that this is gonna work or, 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 or to not work. For example, uh, we get that what to do the map uh, later, like pregnancy wise. You know, actually this uh, big related area here uh, has actually some implication on the placental, like you know how the, the, does it go to the, the fetus or not. Um, so uh, it has maybe less induction of uh, anti-drug antibodies. Um, so it's good to have like idea how that would they like look different. But the uh, IVIG, uh, the map is how most of them they look like. So here they took off all this stuff and they just kept like part of it. Okay, so fixing map. Uh, those are some of the like indications. Uh, I mean. My intention is not to make you feel with all each and every indications, uh, but when it first came out, out for example, a fixing map, and sorry for the brand name, I forget to take it out. Um, so we have the you no know, like for rheumatoid arthritis, but later on they found that it worked for inclusive spondylitis, so they worked for that, and then they found oh, it also worked for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and then later on came for the GI, like uh, uses with Crohn's disease and herpetitis. Um, uh, the intercept has similar uh, like uh, uses, however, because the, how they look like it is not used in Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, but it's still used in uh, rheumatoid and psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and we keep moving here. Um, this is an example of like adalimumab. Uh, it has like 11 approved FDA indications. So all those diseases, that's one drug that has all those FDA approved like indications. So uh, when I say rheumatoid, it's usually moderate to severe rheumatoid, not like a mild rheumatoid that you can use a cheaper drug like methotrexate, for example, uh, black psoriasis, Crohn's disease, pediatric Crohn's disease, arthritis, colitis, uh, pediatric uh, uh, arthritis, colitis, sorry, uh, psoriatic arthritis, the HS syndrome, acute spondylitis, uh, the bilateral juvenile, diabetic arthritis, and then the UVI, the spanning UVI, which is uninfectious. 
with immediate or posterior. So, um, and um, I can tell you that the company of this drug, they waste a lot of money. So, uh, and now we have so many biosimilars, and we're gonna talk about that later. There's so many now drugs in the market, FDA approved that, you know, because they lost their patent. So now there's so many other companies producing this drug because of the sheer market money that, you know, they did produce. Just to give an idea, for example, a one month worth of treatment is about four thousand dollars. You know, like how this like the cost. Um, so um, the rimumab uh, also um, actually because it's human, as we mentioned earlier, has like lower risk of anti drug antibodies, um, and you can measure those antibodies. So like if you have a patient on the drug and the drug was working initially, and then later on. Patients say, oh, well, this drug is not working anymore. Or, like, you know, let's say, you know, which would say, well, just before the next dose, I'm, I'm having more symptoms. It does give you like a hint that this drug maybe is reducing anti drug antibodies, and you can measure that in the lab. Gulenumumab, uh, those are some of the like indications. So, they're like, they're like similar, some of like uh, drugs, they don't have all the like indications. Some, some of them have like different ones. So, uh, so rheumatoid arthritis and cholesterolitis, cirrhotic arthritis, and the GIA. Uh, so, um, those are like the approved uh, indications as well. Uh, so, this one like, is different, it's nothing the other biologics uh, or TNF alpha biologics. So, the what we call the non radiographic spa spinorotropathy, which means a patient with like symptoms of uncleosmod lice, but you don't see it on plain x ray. But patient that does have the like the typical symptoms. So this drug is approved to be used for those group of patients. So um, I can answer this question already. Which drug is more safer in pregnancy among all those five options? So we said to the map the way it looked like it's like more safer. Actually, in Europe, uh, you know, whatever they have as equivalent to FDA, they call it EMA, uh, that the European uh, Medicines Agency, it is actually approved to be used in pregnancy. However, in the US, it is not FDA approved. However, they have kind of like milder uh, drug inserts so that it is like safer. So uh, the like plasma concentration is, is very little, and they have not seen in two studies that it doesn't cause any, any problems. So it's not that they are rude, but you know, it is actually a choice for uh, rheumatologists, for example, if my patient on the drug and she's a serotonin or stress patient and she wanna get pregnant, I like will go like using this drug versus like the other one because it has like a higher safety margin. So we are moving to another class, which we are done with the TNF alpha. So we had the I1 inhibitions. Uh, I have to say these drugs are not much used in the adult rheumatology, but more in the pediatric rheumatology ward. Um, but in the is one of the, the one of it. You know, we, we may use the rheumatoid, but it's not like you know that good drug in rheumatoid. But it has better uses in the pediatric rheumatology. Indication will show that in a little bit. Can the Kinra have those are three FDA drug? Uh, I mean, approved for uh, different rheumatology indications. So. Um, those are some of the pediatric like rheumatology uh, indications. So you see all those like wording, traps and caps and hides and MKD and you know facts. What those are? You know? So um, this is what it means. Like you know, caps are the uh, cryobiron uh, associated periodic uh, 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 syndrome. Uh, the traps is the TNF receptor associated with periodic syndromes. Uh, uh, the the hides is the hyperimmunoglobulin D syndrome, um, etc. So those are actually kind of rare diseases, more seen in the pediatric, uh, like rheumatology, and um, uh, they are under a category called autoimmune uh, disorders. Uh, maybe a typical drug that you are familiar with is the familiar Mediterranean fever. So uh, also it's not very common in the United States, except like in certain ethnic groups like Middle Easterns. Uh, but those they have that kind of similar uh, possible uh, you know like symptoms. So something that's common though. 
Now moving to another class. So we are done with the TF alpha, we are done with the IL1 blockade. So now we're talking about IL6 inhibitions. So this is not gain a lot of uh, like uh, familiarity because of COVID. So it's been used in COVID, uh, ICU, when we had all those like you no know, bad times. But actually we used way earlier ourselves in rheumatoid arthritis and later on game. I think I have the indications here. Yeah. So uh, we started doing that in rheumatoid, and later on, it was approved by FDA for giant cell arthritis. Um, this more recent uh, FDA approval for ILD that happens under the systemic sclerosis, um, and it's also like used in uh, GIA. And you are, I think most of you, I think you are familiar with the COVID use as well. And what happened to us rheumatologists when it was widely used for COVID, we, we are hit bad with COVID. We couldn't find any more to see what to give it our variation. So some of them were, were like stable on a, like a certain dose of rheumatoid, or then there's no more to see in the market because it's all gone for COVID. Then we had to struggle with that and we tried to find other ways to control the symptoms of our patients when that was an issue. But it's not an issue anymore. So cerulumab is another IL6 inhibitor. Just recently, if they added this indication, Bolivar's rheumatica. So Bolivar's rheumatica is, you know, considered as a cousin for giant cell arthritis. We already mentioned that the Sunitumab does work for giant cell arthritis. Uh, BMR is a newer indication, and it's also used for rheumatoid arthritis. Some of these are, are also like, you know, when we choose, let me talk with the patient, we do sure decisions. So some of those are, are like once a week, like sub -Q injections. Most of them are injections. Uh, the few that's that is, we're going to talk about them later. Uh, so, bio biologies are mostly either injection or infusion, but the frequency is different. So, some of them like once a week, once every two weeks, you know, once a month, etc. So, now keep moving. I have 17 inhibitions. So, um, sicrocunumab and exotuzumab. Good luck um, remembering those names. <laughs> so, sicrocunumab uh, came first. And uh, it is actually was a first for psoriasis. Later on, so that was done used first by rheumatologists. And then we rheumatologists came on board because it was uh, for psoriatic arthritis. And then it was spondylitis was a later um, uh, indication. And we talked about this earlier, the non radiographic uh, axial spinal arthritis. So now we have two drugs that, had, uh, that have FDA indication for non radiographic spa, we call it, which is, oh, I jumped, which is ciclopinumab from, from the I-17 inhibitors, and the certuzumab, which is a TNF-alpha inhibitor. So keep moving. That's another I-17 <coughs> inhibitor, uh, and it is currently, uh, I'm saying currently because some of those drugs actually, like usually the little drug would have the major indication first like psoriasis for L17 inhibitors and then there will be trials working you know to get it approved for other indications but so far we have this drug, for example only approved for uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis uh, and this kind of relatively newer group of uh, blockade like you know if you go back maybe seven years ago we wouldn't have any of these uh, uh, the first one came to market this is trichinumab. This one has the advantage of being like less frequent uh, injections, like once every three months, kind of more convenient for patients, but it's not a strong one. Then the other one came later on, uh, the trichinumab and uh, resnacunumab. Um, so for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, mainly. Are you lost or not yet? <laughs> <laughs> Keep moving. So now we have the concentration block. The concentration because uh, this drug, Abatacept, is working on uh, the interaction between B cell and T cell. And actually, there's other biology out there, non for rheumatology use, that they use the concentration block. For example, some of the oncology medications, uh, uh, what we call the checkpoint inhibitor, they use the same blockade. So we don't like to use, for example, Abatacept in somebody with a checkpoint inhibitor. That go checkpoint inhibitor because of like the way they work, they have a lot of actually rheumatology-like side effects. For example, they can have rheumatoid-like picture, giant cell arthritis picture, body mass rheumatica, et cetera. Uh, but about the set, the transmission blockade, and the current indications are for rheumatoid arthritis, the GIA, and psoriatic arthritis. 
some of those drugs have less like you know side effects for therapy. So like all biological in general, they have like infection, uh, but there's like, less data for infection with abatacept. So it might be a choice. Uh, for a rheumatologist, for someone to say who's having a lot of infections because of use of a certain other class, for example, TNF alpha, I might switch to abatacep because it has like less known infection induction for, for those patients. Keep moving. You are familiar with at least the first drug in this group, which is rituximab. Uh, so this is the B cell depletion. Rituximab was used way back in lymphoma before we have the rheumatoid arthritis indication. And this is how they discovered that it does work for rheumatoid. So they had lymphoma patients that they do the proxima core and their rheumatoid is gone. They are, like, they are doing very good. And then they did the studies for rheumatoid arthritis and found, yeah, this is a really good drug for rheumatoid. It's not our first time because it's kind of like very hard drug. So like as you know, our like third or fourth line. Uh, so rituximab came first. Venumumab came after this like very recent drug. And they have like different indications. So for example, the first one we do use promatoid, the other one is not used for this, more for lupus. So rituximab, our uh, rheumatology indications are rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the uh, uh, GBA, the MPA, and this is not rheumatology, but this is like the lymphoma indications that you are familiar with. Um, for lupus, we have those two drugs. This is like an older one, been there in the market for some time, bilirumumab, but this more recent action. Now, for us rheumatologists, um, we didn't have much medications for lupus, although the, all those names for the body were mostly for rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis. We didn't have much advancement in lupus and, until like recently. So recently now, we are having more and more Biologics, some of them are already available in the market. There's a lot of in the line as well. So it's actually an exciting time for people who like to treat lupus because you have more and more biologic coming and look like we have good results for it. Now, talk about biosimilars. So, what biosimilars mean? So, uh, the World Health Organization, the WHO, defined um, defined as a, a, a biotherapeutic product, which is similar in terms of quality, safety, and efficacy to an already licensed, uh, licensed surface um, uh, product. So as an example, we talked about Adelimo map earlier. Uh, see how many biosimilar out there for Adelimo map. Um, actually, I took this slide it does have the uh, some of the uh, brand name, but this like FDA website that showed all the FDA approved drugs. So can you count one, two, three, four, uh, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine? So nine uh, biosimilar for only one of our drugs. Uh, so to be, just to add more names for you. <laughs> so we have so many now biosimilar. Um, it's expected that insurance company will go now more for one of these. Uh, maybe it depends on the states and it depends on how, what they do. They do with the insurance companies. Uh, so uh, probably if I want to like order uh, the remote map, the brand name uh, in the near future, I'll be forced to use one of those preferred drugs because they're a bit cheaper. Uh, and you know how it was like with the uh, like um, BBMs and um, the deal that they get to get like you know better deal on certain drugs. So this is not exactly a, a biologic, but it is a, a newer class of like drugs that we've been using in rheumatology. So I thought I'm gonna just mention those as well. So uh, the boutique um, uh, tyrosine kinase, um, the JAK inhibitor, we call it, uh, it binds to the, um, uh, the type one and type two uh, like JAK uh, uh, receptors. And um, they are um, highly targeted molecules. They are a simple chemical structure than the biologic, you know, the way that they do biologic with the like advanced technology, the, the combinant, uh, DNA is not used here, so it is like less uh, complicated uh, drug in the production. Uh, but um, you know, so it's not exactly biologic, but you know, it came back on at the same time 
I don't want to mention it because there's also some names here that I want you to be familiar with. So those are the three one came in the market. Actually, there was a lot of like marketing initially when these are came, especially like the first one. This like the first one came to market the facitinib, and later on came barcitinib, and lastly, but the citinib came to the market. But it seems it's from the same company that does the Adalimo map. Um, so a lot of marketing, a lot of you, those are all oral, so it's easier for to take, like one tab a day or one tab twice a day. Um, so we were actually happy that, oh, finally we have something oral and patient, many patients don't like injections, don't like infusions. Uh, so we started doing those, but then we were stopped by some of the side effects. I'm, I'm going to mention those later. So the first came first to market. Those are the the approved indications. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and spondylitis, and the uh, GIA. Um, so we need to know about side effects. A lot of drugs, a lot of options. Uh, we have some, have some curiosity of the cat. Look like so to my cat actually, okay. and um, that's why I put this slide because it might be my cat. <laughs> Uh, so let's, let's find out about some of the side effects. So let's go by, by class. So TNF alpha, those are the favorite side effects. Infections, possible malignancies, non-melanoma, skin cancers, uh, uh, such as non-melanoma skin cancer, infection site reaction, infusion reactions, uh, induction of autoimmunity. We talk about antidrug antibodies, for example, the demonating disease and heart failure. So yeah, you know, I found this like important for like during trends, you know, because you might have a patient on one of our drugs and he's coming to you with one of those like possible complications. So you need to be familiar that this you know possible complication can come from the drug. Um, infection is the most common. So TB, I think most of you are, are familiar that you know TB can happen uh, with the use of TNF alpha. Actually, we cannot use if alpha uh, like description will not like be granted by pharmacy uh, or by insurance rather, unless you know they see a recent TB testing within at least one year. Uh, so uh, because case of TB uh, were like reported, it's well documented that TB can happen with the immunosuppression that we use with the alpha. That's the most uh, famous one. Um, so uh, uh, all patients considered for the alpha. Uh, and the therapy should be screened for latent TB. Um, the other like of infection will be viral like infections. Hepatitis is very famous, so it's also the routine of each rheumatologist to screen for hepatitis prior to the use of the alpha. Herbal zoster is also like another complication. It's more in certain drugs like that gofacitinib from the JAK inhibitor. Um, so some drugs are more known to cause herbal zoster versus other drugs. Um, but if you see herbal zoster, patient coming to your clinic and he's on one of those biologic, then suspect that's maybe us doing it rather than that like, natural infection. Bacterial infection might happen, septic arthritis. Um, so septic arthritis, actually the, the, the right scenario to see septic arthritis is maybe someone uh, who is going to do knee replacement or hip replacement, and he's on one of these drugs, and it was missed. Nobody stopped the drug prior to the surgery, but it's like the recommendation to stop the drug ahead of the surgery. Um, and then patients continue taking the medication, then you end up seeing that inpatient with very bad septic arthritis on the top of that you know, uh, joint replacement. So it's getting very ugly, actually. So uh, we have to be familiar with that. So if you are, uh, let's say, a maternist, primary care physician, and you have your patient, then you know, I'm going to go to knee replacement, hip replacement, and you are looking at his drugs, and you see that he's on camp alpha or, or one of those other biologics, be sure to stop that ahead of the like planned elective surgery. Of course, it's like you know, emergency surgery. You need to do it. That's why elective surgery, major elective surgery, we have to start. And those are some of the other like bacterial infection. The other ones are less seen, but they are reported. Um, fungal infections as well. Uh, all those uh, possibilities um, are, are there. Um, but uh, they are seen in less common than TB and herbal zoster and hepatitis. Um, now let's talk about malignancy. This is a major concern. Those are, do they do they, I mean, do they cause malignancy or the other scenario come back patient on this drug and now he's having cancer? 
or somebody with previous cancer history, should I still use the drug? Um, so let's look at some data. Uh, the evidence is mixed with respect of the risk of lymphomas, leukemias, and uh, solid uh, malignancies. Uh, a majority of observational studies have not confirmed an increased risk, although the uh, FDA has issued several warnings uh, regarding such risk. A lack of data from randomized trials to address risk of new or recurrent maintenance in patient, patient with a prior history of cancer. So we don't have like very clear data. There's some case reports. Uh, usually the studies done for values like one, two years. Uh, so to get approval for the drug, those are not like enough time to maybe see maintenance, but the really long-term use. We have those like registries, more maybe in Europe. Um, and like, there's some risk, but then what makes it complicated is uh, the fact that the automatic disease itself and other treatments that, that we use uh, commonly in rheumatology, like to say, do they have, do, they do have their own risk as well of producing with malignancy. So it's uh, like hard to back to judge. Is it really the biologic did it or just the fact that patient has rheumatoid, uh, which has some increased risk, uh, like they did it, or, or is it maybe methotrexate? Uh, this will become harder, but the, the general practice is like this. So if I have a patient uh, on biologic and now he has cancer, uh, our uh, guidelines is to learn, learn, stop the medication if we can. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's some scenario where the you know, patient when we stop it and he has all back the, like symptoms from cancer, but now he has very bad arthritis because he was really had a remarkable response uh, to let's say PF alpha. Uh, so there's some instances where the oncologist would okay me to like doing the drug uh, because of how much miserable the patient became without the drug if the other alternative is not, is not working. Um, but I mean, in general, again, I do stop it with this new cancer um, or this history of cancer, I'll be assistant to start the drug. Keep moving. This is another uh, potential reactant, and fever reactant should be either acute, that I have more than 24 hours, or delayed. Uh, so the acute one is more like allergy reaction, like anaphylaxis. The delayed one is the delayed one is more like serum sickness kind of symptoms, and it can happen between like one to 14 days. Um, so um, then uh, the injection site reaction, so like those drugs are sub-Q, Patient inject might come back to you, maybe to the primary, and show him that he has edema, pain, itching at the site of that injection. Uh, so it's a possible reaction. Sometimes it's bad, and we have to stop the drug. Most of the time, not, they're not as bad. So I advise my patient to put some ice packs on it. Usually, that does relieve it. Uh, so um, most of the time, I don't have to stop the drug for that. Rarely, we did. Um, this is an important one. Uh, this is like maybe one complication that the patient will really hate his rheumatologist and will change his rheumatologist. If the patient get MS-like picture uh, because of that, you know, drug, especially if the, that company was not discussed with the patient, that patient for sure will leave his rheumatologist and will tell the drug and be angry. But I mean, it is actually reported more like in some of those uh, registries in Europe. Uh, so there's like the documented cases. I've seen a couple of cases in, the, in my 20 plus years of practice, um, but it's one of the rare but ugly uh, complication of the use of uh, these species like the DKF outlets. Heart failure, this is also very important for an internist uh, to learn. So if you have a patient who has, let's say, a baseline heart failure, and his rheumatologist started TNF alpha, and now he's having a worsening heart failure, then suspect that this is from the drug TNF alpha in particular. Actually, it is not recommended, it is contraindicated to start TNF alpha for a patient with heart failure at plus three or four, the new criteria. So uh, most rheumatologists are vigilant, but sometimes, you know, some patients are poor historian or somebody come without medical records and Let's say it was started. I think it's where patient had working heart failure because he did start a biologic, mostly in alpha, um, and uh, either the physician was not aware, and then they usually they may improve actually when we start drug. Maybe the patients can have a comment about you know, that later on. So um, 
Those are some other things I'm not going into much details because I don't to overwhelm you. Uh, but those are some of the other complications that we might see cytopenia, like leukopenia as a possibility, infective toxicity. So we do tend to check CBCs, you know, like uh, liver enzymes, at least every six months, because uh, actually we're going to do it every six months as opposed to every three months with the drug like methotrexate that we do. Uh, pulmonary disease, ILD can happen. And that's one actually is kind of interesting. So uh, it's kind of like odd, you know, you, this is like the drug like adrenalumab is. Indicated for psoriasis, but yet it can cause psoriasis, and I've seen that. So, like, let's say we are given this drug for visual for rheumatoid arthritis, <laughs> and then it comes back to you with like scaly rash that look like psoriasis. This is actually a documented uh, complications uh, complication of, the, of this drug. So, again, for PCP and joiners like residents, if you see a patient coming with new psoriatic rash after starting alpha, suspect that this is a side effect, and usually it goes away after you start the drug. So that's why I'm discussing those like uh, complications. I want you to be all familiar with all those potential side effects. So you are vigilant when you see a patient with one of those complications. Um, I'm talking now about different class uh, side effects. Some of them are, are like the same, like the, this is the looking one inhibitors. So infection can happen in the same way, TB. So we do skin TB for all of them, metallurgic, like leukopenia, uh, hepatitis, without, you know, that also can happen with DTF alpha um, and ILD. So those are kind of similar uh, to the side effect that we see with the DTF alpha. And the uh, six inhibitors, some of them are the same, like infection, metallurgy, but this, this epidemia is different. So that's not there in the other ones. So not the if you see your patients have a worsening lipid profile, higher cholesterol, higher triglycerides, it could be that. So actually, it is in our guidelines to monitor lipid profile when we start interleukin six. So for those who do use the solution map, keep that in mind. Uh, another like special thing for this group is this. So interstitial, interstitial, like you know, perfusion of the intestine. That happens usually with somebody with history of diabetic colitis. So usually we don't start uh, this class of drug for someone who has history of diabetic colitis. Uh, intestinal perfusion is a very bad condition might happen. And actually, this condition does happen also with another class, which is the uh, JAK inhibitors. I'm going to show that actually in the next slide, I think. Uh, well, uh, JAK inhibitor. I made this like slide look different, more uh, maybe different color. Why? Because actually, the, uh, when those are skinned uh, at first, they are tablets, easy to take, a lot of marketing. You know, patients were happy, the physician were happy. But then, about is it two years now or three years ago, a uh, black box warning came on uh, from FDA. They found that actually the study was done just on the first uh, drug that was introduced to market, which is the facitinib. So they found more cardiovascular, mostly like uh, MI, ischemic heart disease, more venous thrombosis uh, event, you know, DVT, clots, and even more malignancy. So this black box when it came, actually before this black box when it, you know, like, you know, well, that was released, um, many like insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, Jack Infus was their first line of treatment, not anymore. Now, when we go actually to meeting, and, and you know, like you know, the, the percentage is not that high. The studies are not done on the other uh, JAK inhibitor. However, uh, FDA made the black box warning for all JAK inhibitors. So, actually, that did lead to less use of JAK inhibitors, like you know, nationwide and in worldwide as well. Uh, those are some of the other non-black box warning, but it can happen. So, herpesoster is more famous with Jack and the views. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, hematologic uh, can happen. And gastrointestinal that mean both the liver enzymes increased and that intestinal perforation that can happen also with IL-6 inhibitors. And I think that's just my last slide of side effects. Yeah, so those are some of my preferences. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> So many like drugs I mentioned, I know that it might be overwhelming. I'm, I'm okay with you guys giving my slides and have used as reference. So I, I have no copyright for this. So <laughs> take it, review it whenever you can. 
uh, or whatever you, you want. So it will be helpful. So thank you, Dr. Sackby. I, um, going through, that was a lot. That was uh, encyclopedic. It was wonderful. Um, the one I was looking for, I was looking for lupus, obviously, because we have um, you know, a high incidence of, of that disease here. Uh, and, and but I was also looking for Sjogren syndrome, sickle syndrome. I I don't see that there was a particular drug associated with it. Is that because they're not effective? So that no. So the best. So Sjogren syndrome is a like systemic disease. So yeah. um, I just use here the FDA approved indications. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of non FDA <clears throat> like you know uses for those drugs. But I try to avoid mentioning any non FDA approved. But for sure, for example, we can use rituximab. It's not FDA approved, but you know we use rituximab for more of the like severe complications. For example, somebody with CNS vasculitis from children or transverse myelitis, very like overwhelming complication. So we use the, you know some of those biologic you know for those indications. Um, Sjogren disease, maybe patient with more like arthritis. I might use biologic if patient is not responding to more. Of the classic DMR. I have to be careful, however, because um, one thing I didn't talk much in, uh, in the slides, but uh, under autoimmunity, the TNF alpha can uh, produce actually a new ANA positivity. So, like most like lupus like disease. So, we don't use TNF alpha or we try to, to avoid using TNF alpha in somebody with the ANA positive or some autoimmunity, uh, let's say like mild lupus, because it may induce more lipid symptoms. So some of those drugs are contraindicated in certain like, diagnoses, mm -hmm. some of the classes, but some other tests can be used. For example, uh, tesuzumab, IL-6 inhibitor. There's more and more data coming to you with it for ILD. Um, they are approved only in the scleroderma one, but we use it in other indications as well. But some of those indications, again, they are not FDA approved. That's why I try to avoid mentioning in, in my slides. Understandable. Questions? I had a question about how your approach to counseling for patients with some of these severe side effects, especially thinking about, you know, higher incidence of MS and some of the cancers and sort of what's your pitch that you give to patients, um, how they respond to that, and, you know, do you give them written, you know, written counseling information more, because some of those ones really can freak patients out, so I was just curious. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, and uh, especially, you know, we're busy. Like ward when they give you like maybe 20 minutes for patients, maybe the new patient, but he was in a follow-up slot, etc. Um, so it is challenging. Um, so uh, I mean, do I do it? I always like if I want to start new drug, I, I you know our EMR does allow us to give like print out for these side effects. Usually we go over like the most famous side effects rather than like each and, and everyone. But we like encourage patients to go over and then actually do I do it? Let's say patients do start because sometimes you know things happen. You want to start drug and patient review and come back, you know, doesn't want to do it. But let's say patient eventually did do it. I, I can like you know also keep mentioning potential side effects. For example, I know that this patient might go to surgery. I want to make sure before surgery you have to stop your the limo map, for example. Do we that we do it? You know, I didn't mention that in slide because I don't want to make a really long presentation. So the way to like to start, for example, with surgery is to look at the dosing. So if I have a drug that I use once a week, I add one more week to the dosing, let's say ten step, and then the patient would hold the drug for two weeks prior to that elective surgery, and then two weeks after. Another example, another drug is used every two weeks, let's say the map. The same story. I add one more week, that's now three weeks prior to surgery. And then two weeks after, he can assume if there's no complications like infections. So um, it is hard to mention. Like, I didn't let you like this for one hour. I'm <laughs> it all. That's not doable. I give them like you know like you know the information, and I try to give them something like if they actually do start drugs, you know, every time. Make sure like you know the follow-up visit that we are screening for anything happening, and give them information. But yeah, it's hard. I admit that. Yeah. A couple of questions from our chat area. Um, one oh, that's from, oh, did you get in, Dr. William? Uh, I, I, I did, the first one I saw. Was, <laughs> trying to read it from the chat. So yeah, one of, of course, was uh, the question about the microbiome and changes that happen uh, with the biologics. Uh, and obviously that's uh, of interest because we know that the microbiome is responsible for a lot of immune responses and, and uh, 
we, I, as it's, it's a big question because as a journal editor for a prevention journal, it all these case reports and some small case series saying that if you change to a whole food plant-based diet, all of this stuff goes away. I don't see any randomized trials of nutrition versus, uh, uh, versus any of the drugs, but if there was going to be an effect, it would be mediated, one would think, by the microbiome. Yeah, so my, my response to this issue, we go more with like the guidelines and instructions of our, the American College of Rheumatology. So there's no uh, such like recommendation to like avoid certain, for example, you know, much like food uh, for like, you know, those indications of talk about like rheumatoid or stress arthritis. Um, it does actually, I mean, so like for talk about food in particular, um, I think most of us are familiar with like the uh, like gout story where you have to avoid the urine producing like products like you no know, alcohol, but it's not as clear in the other uh, rheumatic diseases. So um, I mean, unless as you said, there's like more maybe data coming and more clear guidance, than the, like you know, advise patients to avoid certain things. Another chat question you said? Oh, here for uh, I'm sure I'm the oldest rheumatologist in the room. Uh, so it's not for you, this lecture. This is more for another rheumatologist. I left, I left the easy. practice of rheumatology the year that the first biological came up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I saw my first patient with rheumatoid arthritis 53 years ago. As a trainee, a medical student, I don't see any here. But my it was a patient admitted by a well known rheumatologist uh, who had an infected rheumatoid nodule. And when I was sent to the laboratory to do the gram stain, I found, my goodness, this is a patient with chronic patient scalp. And my observation can probably set the quote direction for the career. Uh, that makes my hair curl now that I see that they're recommending biologics for uh, some patient scalps. Uh, but the, the point I wanted to make there was that diagnosis is still, making a proper diagnosis in a difficult range of diseases is still important. Right. Um, that was the age of uh, that was the age of where we didn't have much evidence-based medicine. Uh, my understanding is these drugs are clinically very helpful in terms of the clinical symptoms of rheumatic diseases. I have no personal knowledge. Uh, in, in my in my day, we had almost nothing that we were sure was effective. It was high dose aspirin, which never caused major GI bleeding in my view, but certainly every lots of a number of patients became iron deficient because of the, the, the continuous uh, blood loss. Uh, it was, a, I, I would recommend, as I was taught, up to 20 aspirins a day <laughs> until I did a, 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 a double-blinded study with my, my friend, uh, uh, Stephen Clay and our fellows where we took high dose aspirins and I woke up at night suffocating. Uh, and the, the, the reason was that aspirin uh, decouples oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, we had gold, and I inherited a panel of patients on gold. I was never 100% sure what it was doing. If one went back to the literature to try to find if it was effective or not, the, the, the evidence was very thin on the ground. Uh, I don't, I, I, I need, is anybody using gold anymore? I have no confidence that it was effective, <laughs> but it required the patient to come in regularly with blood tests and so forth. Uh, there was uh, there was uh, penicillamine, which yeah. was approved, but I didn't know anybody who ever gave it to a patient. I, I never used it myself. We had Plaquenil, which probably was effective for patients with mild disease. Uh, then came methotrexate, which you didn't mention today. It's, I guess it's not a biological, but that was the first drug, to my knowledge, where you didn't need a statistician to tell you that it was effective because it, it brought about remission, the bonds to bone remission. Uh, and I, I guess it's still a good, good drug. Um, my understanding is that these, these new drugs, biologicals have, have changed the, the, the patient's uh, uh, lifestyles. It certainly has changed the, the lifestyles of the rheumatologist. A famous, uh, a well-known colleague of mine wrote a paper for arthritis and rheumatism that it wasn't it wasn't financially smart to become a rheumatologist because you didn't make any more money than a general internist uh, and, and you had to do more training. Uh, but now uh, rheumatologists uh, are the highest, receive the highest payments for Medicare of any other specialty that I, I know of. This is an expensive business. Um, 
But if it, if it and it seemed with all, I'm overwhelmed. I have no idea there were so many of these. I have a feeling that there's going to be a great shakedown uh, in terms of what is it? And there's down. way more coming. You know, <laughs> way more. it has been said that no disease can be declared incurable unless the trial of colchicine has been given. And I have a feeling that the same thing is going to be said about the biologicals. I'll, I'll shut up there, but I. Uh, I felt empowered that I made to the, to make a few comments. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I remember uh, when I did actually my fellowship in rheumatology, and that was at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, but what you know, the VDA where they had some patient on gold, uh, but they are not used anymore. Just as that one point. Uh, but yeah, uh, my fellows they work at the VA now. Now I'm not, but I mean, part of our program is at the, at the VA, and they do tell me that. Some of the patients they used to use gold, and sometimes they see something in their X-ray to like tell them that, and etc. Yeah. <laughs> I think we had a couple more questions, yeah. Dr. Emmons. Yeah, from uh, Dr. Emmons, he's in our uh, he's in our uh, blood and bone marrow uh, transplant group in human in oncology. And the question is, that a major bio yeah a major biologic therapy is cellular therapy and the focus at our upcoming ash meeting is the use of car t therapy for refractory rheumatologic conditions example cd19 car t for renal refractory lupus can you comment on cellular therapy in rheumatology yeah so uh, as i said uh, there's a lot of um, pipeline treatment like out there so like, actually like for example i i myself I'm involved in a lupus trial. Uh, one of the uh, drugs that is infusion is not FDA approved yet, but it's like a C3. We are expecting, like, this is new outcome. So, so, yeah, there's so many out there. Um, uh, you know, cell uh, you know, uh, therapy, um, like interferon related therapies, um, like, a lot of them involved in with the nephrologist. Uh, I do have a combined type of uh, nephrology. So, this, this drug that it is. Uh, also, be the bleeding uh, cell mechanisms like those of toxin, but it has a like, different way of action. And uh, we are using that for lupus nephritis. And it has, you know, like a uh, lot of good results. So, I mean, the, I think this question maybe need a kind of lecture by itself. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but um, my uh, my goal for, for uh, this actually that was more to familiarize anybody who's not there with all those like drug names. So we at least know the name, know the class of action. I only consider on the FDA approved like indications, and I just wanted the ability to be done with the current present drug, use drug, what the side effects. But there are a lot of other discussions, like for other like mechanisms of actions and other potential treatments for other indications, but that will take us for the other future lectures. <laughs> Fantastic. And just one more, this also from Dr. Edmonds. He says, uh, wants to know how have these various biologic events informed us about the etiology, etiology of rheumatologic conditions? Are we getting closer to the age of predictive medicine in rheumatology? Now, that's a good question. Uh, you know, like that. I mean, this is how actually they invented those drugs. So, you know, like people are in, in the lab uh, doing all those science and then they are seeing, oh, okay, well, uh, TNF alpha is, uh, you know, if I do blockade, I might get results. So actually, TNF alpha, it's kind of interesting. Dr. Williams is, is a cardiologist. When they first actually worked on that, they were more thinking curing of like heart disease, ischemic heart disease. But then they found on the country to cause like a heart failure. And then, but then they discovered that it does, you know, be used in uh, rheumatology. So yeah, I mean, uh, because of uh, basic science, people who are, who are working like hard in the lab, they are discovering all those pathways and then trial you know, was initiated. And then some of those trials are successful and then we end up having a Google. So, so yeah, I mean, this is um, how, how it goes. That's all from the chat, so. Well, fantastic. Any any other questions from the group here? I don't know. Like One final question, more of yeah. a practical question. So my practice is in primary care and with, all some specialties. One thing that we struggle with is at what point, um, uh, what is our scope of practice uh, when it comes to um, especially some of the newer treatments? Um, at one point, I thought the biologics, we were getting to the point where I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I could probably start prescribing a tanner set, you know. 
And just when I felt like we were going that direction, you know, instead it exploded and now there's a thousand of them. So, um, so I haven't landed on a, um, on a decision yet, or at least a temporary one as to, to what degree of any primary care doctors um, should be in the business of using biologics um, directly and in rheumatology in particular, because we, at least in this area, have a shortage of rheumatologists. In primary care, we practice a little bit more rheumatology ourselves than we probably should or care to. And so, you know, I know I'm sure Dr. Callan uses these in dermatology, for example. Um, we don't necessarily have the mechanism in our office to like, you know, we, we don't have the staffing to have somebody make sure that like, okay, everybody on biologics is getting their every six month labs and, you know, their, their EBD or quantiferon and et cetera. So I just wonder sort of what is your take on that? As a rheumatologist, do you feel like these classes of medications are ones um, that are going in the direction of becoming more and more specialized? versus, you know, are we getting to the point that they've been, you know, cer certain ones at least have been used enough that um, sort of the rest of us could consider using them? Yeah, so my, my answer for this, this is a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, uh, so I think it is overwhelming for a primary care physician or internist to deal with all those drugs, but there's so many like side effects and when, uh, like someone is a rheumatologist and he's like into that word, that thing on the meeting, get all the you know like the interaction with the drugs and uh, like conferences, drug reps, etc. Kitchen, so he's like very familiar with like all those aspects. Or so maybe primary care, who as you said, you know, with other specialists as well. I think it'd be overwhelming. That's one point. But more importantly, I don't see it happening because uh, those drugs are expensive and many times they require prior authorization and the insurance actually when you do that the first question are you a rheumatologist are you a dermatologist if he's like a dermatologist doing one of those applications i think if the answer is no probably they will not let the drug get prescribed so so i think you're going to get blocked by insurance at least for many of those drugs now there's maybe a few exceptions where for example, like Medicaid in Michigan, um, they are okay prescribing a talent set as a demo map without prior art. I, I'm not sure, if, however, they're gonna look at who is prescribing it. I know that, for example, I'm in the clinic and I have a resident from Termis who work with me, and if he or she tried to send them, most of the time they will not grant that. So uh, that now I have had them, you know, I'll, you know, kind of refill. Go ahead and refill his metric safe folic acid, but leave the biology for me because I know it will come back to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they allow uh, non rheumatologist or non special like rheumatologist, you know, et cetera, to do it. Um, and talking maybe to the point of metric safe, I've seen like, for example, a similar drug like metric safe, some internists like they, they do it on their own, they can do that. But then I just see like the monitoring happening. So uh, many times I see a patient coming after one year, you know, let's say from some primary care, and like for maybe six months or one year, no CBC was done, no events that were done, and we don't like that. So yeah. if someone wants to do it, want to do it right. Yeah. I think we did have one more. Yeah, the other the other issue with the biologics is the is the prior authorization. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's not because you couldn't do it, you know. I mean, it, it, but the work involved. Yeah. Getting a prior authorization for all these biologics yeah. is incredible. I mean, we have, uh, you know, we have a lot of physicians in our office, but we have uh, we have people who are basically spending their whole day getting prior authorizations. Yes. Um, now, sometimes it's even stupid stuff like trying to snore cream that we have to get prior authorized. Yeah. But but it's, I, I think you, you don't want to you, you you'll add so much grief to your life by trying to prescribe the biologics. Not because you can't, and I'm not, you know, not, to, not because you should, because, you know, I mean, you know, if you feel comfortable with it, and a lot of these drugs are relatively easy to use, and although there's this uh, side effect profile, if you read the side effect profile of aspirin or almost any other drug, and you focus on that with the patient, the patient's not going to take the drug. Um, if you focus on the, you know, 
uh, I use a lot of uh, anti-TNFs, and the number of patients that I've seen who have had heart failure from TNF is zero. The number of patients I've seen who has has had had an MS develop is one. Uh, infections are a little more of a problem, but but the the biologics, uh, some of these biologics have been incredibly safe. Um, now, you read the side effect profile, you know, you, patients don't want to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you both. And I, I mean, it sounds like the logistics are overwhelming, and we're going to have to get past the phase of our staff spending all their time on GLP-1s. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the real reason I asked, I think, is because, you know, in teaching primary care, I always want to make sure, like, I'm not just taking the easy, you know, we're not just being scared of cats about it, right? Make sure that we're teaching uh, the what the real world looks like and should look like in terms of if people going to practice primary care, you know, what should be within their scope of practice. So I have been prescribing them and it sounds like I'm not going to start doing that. This <laughs> Thank you. Very One much. last question. Real quick. Yes. Um, Moving forward or upstream or downstream, whatever, uh, since biologics is CRISPR being used for human disease now, could you create a self uh, biologic producing monoclonal demography with a kill switch? So you're going to go into huge confusions for years and years. Kill it when it stops working, create a new one. I'm not sure. That's a good one. Well, Thank you. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> oh, no, this is uh, uh, one of our uh, traditions here at University of Louisville. You get uh, your own oh. Louisville Slugger badge. Nice. Okay. Oh, so we have to mail it to you. Apparently, you can't get it on the plane. But actually, you, are you, you didn't drive. No, no, I'm, I'm flying. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, yeah. I think we'll come on. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. One more thing, and that's on the cardinal minute.